Today we are starting our series, The Marriage You Always Wanted. I hope that the principles that we talk about, that we can laugh a little bit, because we're going to get serious a little bit, but it's my intent that we want to learn really some of uh, God's pr principles. If you are watching online, by the way, welcome. If you're watching according to Facebook Live, welcome. We're glad that you're here with us. If you're kind of catching up with us, you will want to do it. You'll want to go and on YouTube, you want to Google Gaffigan Weddings and watch the clip because even though Gaffigan does a, does a great job making us laugh about the everyday things with a little bit of irony. Uh, there's some truth. There's some truth in what he says. There's considerable amounts of truth in that clip. Because here's what I would say. Most of us grow up being filled, being bombarded with fairy tales. Fairy tales and fantasies about what our weddings should look like. And then we kind of jump that over into what our marriages ought to look like. And so I would argue that Hollywood and culture has replaced reality of an image of, an image of marriage that no one can ever make. No one could ever attain. No one should ever want to attain. And the problem is we bought it. We believed it. And we try to live by it. So much so that when things don't look like what we see in the movies or we see on, on the screen, we get grossly disappointed. Disappointed enough, I would argue, that we give up. And we keep looking for that perfect someone who will fulfill our fairy tale dreams. But it's never ending. It's never ending pursuing that perfect person and pursuing that perfect marriage because it never existed. We've created a bunch of false expectations that are impossible to attain, that are impossible to find the marriage we truly want. Some years ago, there was a movie called Jerry Maguire. All right? I'm not saying it's a good movie or a bad movie, all right? so don't, don't take me on that. But how many of you saw it? Don't worry. You can raise your hand in church. How many saw it? Okay, okay. And uh, here, here it is if you haven't seen it. Jerry was this high-powered sports agent whose job got cut, got eliminated. He was put on the streets, and because of that, he lost his marriage. And of course, in the Hollywood style, the person who came along who deeply met those needs and showed him what life was all about was this assistant of his. And in this movie, a common relationship cliche was kind of elevated to our self-awareness. Do you remember what that cliche was? Remember what it was? You... Yes, and also those all girl voices telling me that, but you complete me, and oh, it sounds so wonderful, so romantic that there's someone else out there in this world that finally, finally completes my life, because up until the time I met you, my life has been half full, my life has been a quarter full, but now, now you are completing me. So if you're listening at all, that's a fairy tale. And I often share this in weddings that I do. Listen, if someone ever tells you that, run. Run away. Because what's the truth of that statement? The truth of that statement is simple. That this person is extremely needy. This person is codependent, dysfunctional, and has no real identity in and of themselves. And now, guess what? The pressure's on because you have to complete them. You're the one who has to meet their deepest needs. And here's the truth. You can't. It's a fairy tale. But we bought into it, haven't we? Because here's the math. Here's what we believe. That a half person, it's an addition thing, plus another half person equals a whole marriage. And that's just not true. It's actually multiplication that works. One person times one person equals one marriage. You must be whole in yourself before you could have a whole marriage. Now, I know, I know, some of you might argue, well, didn't God, right? God gave Adam a wife because it was not good for man to be alone. And so, okay, I get that. But in the story, when God finished, created everything, he said it was very good. He didn't say it was half good. And God created man and woman to be joined together for companionship, for an intimate helpmate along the way. Listen carefully now. Helpmate, not soulmate. Ooh. Did I just push your button? Helpmate, not soulmate. Your Bible 
never mentions, never implies, never teaches anything about a soulmate. It never tells us that there will be somebody else out there that will fulfill or complete your soul. We have made that up. And that person, if you're still holding on to that, does not exist, yet we buy it. And so when we think that this spouse of mine in my marriage is not fulfilling my soul, then there must be somebody else out there who really is a soulmate. And you'll keep looking and looking and looking. Because no one can meet that need. Well, actually, there is somebody. And that's God. And that somebody sent his son Jesus in very human form to connect with your soul. And only Jesus can fulfill your soul. Only Jesus can give you that deep satisfaction and identity, a soul-to-soul intimacy. So very simply, if you're looking for your spouse to be your soulmate, here's what you're looking for. You're wanting them to be Jesus. So right now, if you're here with your spouse, I want you to turn to your spouse and say, Sorry, honey, you ain't Jesus. Come on. And I think you can have some fun with this truth. I really do. Because you know how it is out there. Someone, someone, sometime is going to come up to you and say, oh man, I'm just so excited. I think I've met my soulmate. And you can say, wow, I'm so excited. You've met Jesus? And I know, for some of you, that sounds really super religious. And you might be thinking this, Pastor John, when I say soulmate, I'm really not describing that. Yes, you are. I think you do. I think you believe that there's another person on the planet that can fill your soul. And yet, so many, if that's their goal, they come up empty. And they're marrying and getting divorced and marrying and getting divorced because they want to find that person to fulfill their core of who they are. And that core of who you are was never meant to be filled by another person. And you'll be in trouble because your spouse will never meet that expectation. And there's not a person on the planet who will. And that's only one of the fairy tales. That's only one of the fantasies. There are a bunch more, from Hallmark cards to means to the action movies. Okay, here you go, guys. In every action movie, right? You know, there's this rough and tough guy, and he ends up always falling in love with who? Oh, it's this rough and tough girl. And she's got big breasts and short shorts, and she can outkick, outpunch, outshoot the entire Russian army. And you're like, yes, wow. It's fantasy. Is that who you want to be the mother of your children? (laughs) When you're a man-child, when you have the flu, and guys, you know you're the biggest baby when you have the flu. Is that who you want taking care of you? A nine millimeter pointed right at your face. Get better. (laughs) It's fantasy. And if we really think about it, what happens here? What does Hollywood do? They create, in their action movies, guys are going to watch action movies. So they dream up whatever our, you know, central emotional feelings are, this woman. And women, (laughs) rom-coms aren't any better. It's always this thin, great hair, good-looking guy who's funny. And everything says, oh, he's so funny. He's just this companion. And you know what? When he does something wrong, you notice in the rom-coms, whenever the guy does something wrong and the girl tells him, you just screwed up, he always says, oh, yeah, you're right. I was wrong. Fantasy. (laughs) They are putting the image of that kind of guy to sell tickets to make money. But here's the key. We've seen this over and over again, men with men, gals with gals, and we buy it. And we bring that expectation right into our marriages. Could it be that we're looking for fulfillment in all the wrong places? So that's what we're going to talk about in the upcoming weeks, all right? How can we find real fulfillment in marriage? And we're going to come back to a common truth. A key verse, a God-given truth that was given in the very beginning of the Bible, and Jesus repeats it. So it's important when Jesus repeats it, right? Mark chapter 10, here it is. Jesus said this, God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. You've heard that at a wedding? Many of you, yes, you've heard that at a wedding? So here's what I want to do. 
At the very beginning of the series, I want to go back, for those of you who are married, and I want to go back and I want to start at the very beginning of your marriage. I want to start on your wedding day. And I want us to look at some of those truths and some of those fairy tales that perhaps started on your wedding day and then have carried over into your marriage. And by the way, okay, if you're single here today, I want you to be blessed in this series. And here's why you're blessed, two reasons. First, if you would like to get married, I hope this series helps you. I hope it gives you some godly expectations for what marriage really looks like. But secondly, here's what I know. If you're single, this is true, right? Your married friends are always coming up to you and complaining, right? Someone, some single person say amen. And they're always complaining and they're whining. Well, now we want to give you some truths, some godly truths you can share with them, all right? So instead of just talking about the bachelor or the bachelorette, let's, let's speak some truth into their lives. Okay, let's go back. First official day of your marriage. And I want you to ask, what really mattered on your wedding day? What was real versus what was fairy tale? First one here. What's real is a wedding that was beautiful but not glamorous. There's what's true. Let me just talk to you gals just for a little bit here. From little on, you have been desirous of beauty. You've desired to be beautiful and be called beautiful, and I believe there's nothing wrong with that. I believe that's something God-given. God has hardwired you for beauty, to be beautiful inside and out. There's a song in the Bible about Song of Solomon, right? And in that song, it's a love song between a husband and a wife. And here's a powerful verse that speaks to your heart and speaks to a deep core need. It's when the husband says, you are beautiful, my darling, beautiful beyond words. You are altogether beautiful, my darling, beautiful in every way, beautiful on the outside, beautiful on the inside, beautiful in everything that you do. And on your wedding day, you desire to be beautiful beyond words and in every way. And that's okay. That's a good desire. And yes, of course, you wanted to be beautiful in your outward appearance, but also beautiful in God's way. And here's the thing. On your wedding day, God, he wanted you to be beautiful. He created you to be beautiful. Psalm 139, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Each and every one of you women were made beautiful in the sight of God. So there's nothing wrong with having beauty. There's nothing wrong to be noticed for that on your wedding day. You know, I I bet most of you tried to do that, right? You had had the wedding dress. You did your hair. And and maybe even if you didn't have a formal wedding, right? Maybe maybe it was at a courthouse you went to a judge. I guarantee you, you didn't go in sweatpants and a flannel shirt on that day, right? You, You wanted to look good for your husband. You wanted to look presentable. There was something in you that wanted to be beautiful. Nothing wrong with that. Here's where the craziness, though, starts. Here's where the fairy tale begins. When your wedding becomes more about you than what you're actually saying on your wedding day. When it becomes more important about how you look than what your vows and your commitments are. Gals, I think you know in your heart when you cross over this line. When during picture taking, you're hoping that somehow you end up on the cover of Cosmo. And you actually enjoy the picture-taking time more than you do the ceremony. And you spent more money on your photographer, your videographer, than you did on your honeymoon. If that's the case, let me speak this gently. You're in the glam, baby. You're in the glam. And if you add it all up, the dress, the hair, the makeup, the shoes, all the photographers, all that, if that costs more than a down payment on a house where you're going to be living the rest of your life, you did all of that for 45 minutes of fame. And that's not a great foundation at all to start your married life on. That's a fairy tale. Because that comes and that's gone in an instant. If your wedding was trying to, to emulate the royal wedding, guess what? You didn't have a royal wedding. Unless, you know, unless you're Meghan Markle, and you can have her family problems if you want, all right? 
Once again, nothing wrong with a fancy dress. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong at all wanting to look beautiful for your husband. Nothing wrong with him having, looking at you saying, you are the most beautiful woman in the planet. All of that is godly. All of that is good. But if you care more about what your bridesmaids think of you than what your groom thinks of you, that's glam. Now, I'm not being a prude here. My wife looked beautiful on her wedding day, and I'm so glad she cared about that. I'm glad she still cares about that. And she is truly beautiful in every way. And one of the biggest mistakes I make in my marriage is not telling her that enough. But reality in married life, if you've been married long enough at all, it's never glam. Yes, celebrate the beauty on the outside, but as you grow in your marriage, you should be celebrating the beauty on the inside. That's why God, when he talks about marriage, says this very specifically, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. You should clothe yourself instead with a beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious to God. Now, this doesn't mean you can't do your hair doesn't mean you can't wear nice clothes or jewelry, but in the context, if you study this verse, this verse had all to do with women whose identity through power manipulation was all about glamour. In other words, this verse had to do with being a diva. But all the attention was about them. It was about living for glamour instead of living for God. It was caring more about the outside than caring on the inside. And I want you to understand, if you look at God and his word, he cares deeply about beauty. He's all about having a creation that's beautiful. And his standards for beauty are far greater than Hollywood's. And they're far more fulfilling. And I would say this to you men, it's those standards are what you're going to want out of your wife. Because those are going to meet deeper needs of of you. Think about this with me. Hollywood beauty never lasts. Do you ever see the little ads, you know, and they show this Hollywood star from the 60s or 70s, and there's a little caption underneath. It says, see what they look like now. How awful would you want that about you? <laughs> when they take this picture, when you look your best, now see what they look like. But that beauty, what's it telling us? It all fades. Women, let me encourage you. You know, Proverbs 31, get into it this week, dive into it this week, and see what real beauty is all about. Here's just one verse in it. Charm is deceptive, and beauty doesn't last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. It's not just outward. It's not just a glamour. All right, number two. What really mattered at your weddings? A wedding that was honorable, not superficial. So here we go, guys. Let me talk to you here. What really mattered to you on your wedding day was to be a man of honor and to have a day of honor. A desire deep down to be that man who was upstanding, who was respected. A man who's going to stand by her gal through it all. So yes, vows mattered. And yes, words mattered. And how you stood up front and how you displayed yourself. You wanted to look strong and decent and respectable. And I would add, that's exactly who God created you to be. And when God tells you to love, he tells you to do it in a strong way, in a respectable way. 1 Corinthians 16, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you done, let all that you do be done in love. But men, let me just tell you, Here's what gets in the way of honor and respect. All that is fantasy, all that is superficial. And you know what I'm talking about. All the things that you have seen on your screen over the years. All of that fantasy that is created in your mind that is coming from just these very superficial desires, not honorable desires. So guys, you know what I'm talking about. Whatever stuff you and the boys joke about, whatever movies or pictures that you have seen that have hindered you from holding your marriage with honor. All those physical things you have daydreamed about, they are not reality. It's not what happens to you on your wedding night, nor in the marriage bedroom. Your mind, whether... Whether you want to admit it or not, has been clouded by this fantasy and fairy tales that are not honorable. 
And that fantasy, if that stays in the back of your head, during then, translated over into your marriage, it leads you into bitterness and anger at your spouse. And bitterness and anger even to yourself because you know it's not honorable. And your expectations aren't real. They're superficial. And maybe even by chance, if some of it gets fulfilled in part, that stuff is never going to last because that stuff is never satisfied. So you need to think back, men, to your wedding day and truly see that, yes, you did desire to be a one-woman man, and you did desire to be that man of honor and respect, and deep down, you want to have a great reputation because you care what people say about you. It really does matter. Proverbs 22.1, choose a good reputation over great riches. Be held in high esteem. That's better than silver or gold. And here's what happened, guys. In our culture, somewhere along the line, we have lost what it means to be an honorable man. We have lost what it means to be above reproach. We, we've lost what it means to have a godly reputation. Now, here's the good news around this. God can make all things new. By his grace, and in him he can restore this reputation you long to have. And believe it or not, God can rewire those desires. Because I really believe, I really believe we want to be right alongside with Paul. I really believe at the core of what we desire in our marriage is this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any excellence, and I think, guys, in our heart of hearts, we want excellence. If there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Stand up for these things. Have it be a person of reputation by these things. And, and it's not just for the guys either. This, this is for the gals. I believe you, on, you long for honor and respect as well. So once again, dive into Proverbs 31 and see how God describes an honorable woman. It's about honor and leadership in the home, but not just the home, at work, in her community. These are the things that are going to matter in your marriage. And yet I would say this. Women, even you too, today that kind of honor is hardly recognized once in a while, right? Once in a while we hear about this woman, maybe it's in the news and, and, and how she did in her job or what she did in the community, but really it, it hardly gets noticed. What gets all the attention? The superficial, the divas, they get all the attention. And if we see enough of that and hear enough of that, we start to believe it. And we think that's what matters in our marriage. Follow the Hollywood marriages. Stuff that's based on the superficial, they never last. The bachelorette, the bachelor marriages, what, what is it now? Two years tops, do they last? Why? Because they like being the bachelor. They like being the bachelorette. They like all the attention they get when they're single. It's all about them and being doted on. It's based upon how they look, all the shallow, superficial stuff of life. And yet, that's what happens in so many marriages today relationships that are built on the shallow stuff and so you know just think back let's get married with all the bells and whistles and then let's have a party and let's copy what we see in the movies but if your relationship is just built on that that doesn't last it's based on friendship it's based on companionship it's based upon somebody who's going to help me when life gets hard If it's all about the party, if it's all about looking good, that's not reality. I think if you were to talk to any older couple, right? Been married 40, 50, maybe 60 years. You say, tell me a story that really mattered in your marriage. How did you know your marriage was really good? They're not going to tell you, oh, yes. I remember, you know, one night we just, we went on this moonlit walk. It was so beautiful. They're they're not going to look at you, and and they're not going to tell you, you know, oh, yeah, it was this vacation. That's when I knew. No. They're going to tell you, yeah, it's when we hit a hard patch. We had to deal with a health crisis with one of our kids. When when my husband lost his job. When, When we didn't know what to do with one of our teenagers. 
You're going to, that's when they, that's what they look back during those hard times. Yes, it was hard. We didn't like each other through that. But when we got through that, our love was deeper. Our relationship grew. The intimacy of the companionship grew stronger because we helped each other through that. It was more intimate. It was more fulfilling than I could ever imagine. See, we need to move past the superficial. We need to move into what is truly honorable. This is why God says this in Hebrews 13, give honor to marriage. Remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Marriage is all about bringing honor to what God says is honorable. So how can I bring honor to God, honor to my family, honor to myself and my spouse in my marriage? And I think there's something deep within us that cries out for that, that says, yes, yes, that's what I want. And here's, what, here's the deal. Most of us said the right words. Most of us said the honorable and did the honorable thing on our wedding day. We just need to remember that. Next. What really mattered on your marriage was a wedding day, was a wedding that displayed love and not infatuation. Most of us agree, right? You got married for love. Love the best you understood it at the time. And when you were, you were looking for love, right, you were wanting to, to be loved, you were wanting to love somebody else. But here's what most in our culture do not understand. Most do not understand what love is. We feel that, that, that love is just this emotion, right? We, if, you, if you watch all this stuff, it's this warm, fuzzy feeling. It's like, oh, when I look, I look, I just feel so good. And it's just like a piece of chocolate cake. Think about it. It's the same emotion. Okay, maybe less. Well, if you eat the whole cake, maybe not. But maybe less. It's the same exact emotion that you feel toward chocolate cake. If you think about the feeling of it. Yet the Bible doesn't talk about love as an emotion. It doesn't just talk about that. Yes, it says you have passion, desire, but that's not the foundation. Rather, love is defined as giving sacrifice, and commitment. It begins with a heart commitment, and then it moves into action, and the feelings follow. A chocolate cake can't do that. Let's look at a Bible passage, all right? It's a Bible passage that often gets read at weddings. Paul wrote it, didn't write it for weddings. He wrote it for what the commitment should be within the church, but I think it can be applied to your, to your wedding. How many of you heard this passage? 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful. It endures through every circumstance. What are you hearing? Giving, sacrifice, commitment. And you said the words on your wedding day. In sickness and in health, for rich or for poor, as long as we both shall live. But that's not what we see in the movies, rarely if ever. It's all about infatuation. It's all about how they look. Does this person make me happy? Right? Listen. If marriage, was, <laughs> if marriage was just about making you happy 24-7, 365 days a year, whoo, you are in for a rude awakening. I guarantee you, there are days that I do not make my wife, Cherie, happy. Why? Because that would be a lot of work. No. <laughs> why? Because I'm a piece of work. That's why. Not happy. No happiness, none. Think about your deep love for God. If that's just based on a feeling, oh, we had this worship song, oh, I had this time of prayer, what happens when you don't have those feelings? Oh, God doesn't exist. Is that? No, it's based on a yes, a saying yes, heart commitment to Jesus. That is followed by, I want to follow Jesus. Jesus talks about that. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. It's based on love for Jesus. Yes, I love you, Jesus. So of course I want to follow you. I want to obey you. I made this heart commitment, and now I want to act on that heart commitment. That is what real love is. Paul is really clear about this for all you guys. 
For you husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He gave up his life for her. He came under her. We are to come under our spouse, support our wives, give our wives which, whatever they need to grow, to develop, to be that companion, to be that helper, to show love. It's a commitment. It is giving. It is sacrifice. And that grows so much deeper than on the first day when you said, I do. Okay, last thing. And this is where I think our culture just misses it in our weddings. We need to remember that. Our wedding was sacred. It wasn't filled with fantasy or fairy tale. It was a sacred, sacred moment. The words we said and the way that we said them were before God, right? And these witnesses was a sacred, holy moment. That means it was set apart. Here's how I know this. You have not repeated those words at the water cooler, have you? You have not repeated those words during a Packer game, have you? At least I hope not. Come on. You, 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 those were sacred words. It was a holy moment. This is why here at Hope we strongly encourage, although, you know, I often tell couples, hey, this isn't my wedding. You guys can, you know, it's your wedding. You have freedom to choose. But we strongly choose that they choose, you know, encourage you to choose songs and vows and prayers and try to create this sacred space, this worship service. And, and sometimes, very often, we give little suggestions. Little things to remember that, that help create that sacred space. So, you know, after the unity candle thing or, or now the sand ceremony or whatever little ceremony you want to do, during that music time, after you get done doing it, I often encourage the couples to say a prayer out loud to each other at that time. Why? Because it's a holy moment. It's the first prayer they are praying now that they're married. Or maybe you want to start the, the, the service with a worship song, giving thanks to God for the glory of this day. And you recall, don't you? You recall the words that you said. And if you really look back at them, they were sacred things. Traditional words, yes, but so many of those traditional words are deeply steeped in Scripture and in holiness. To lift up, to lift up what Jesus said. God made them male and female from the beginning of the creation. And that explains why a man and father, why his father and mother is joined to his wife. The two united into one. Let no one split apart what God has joined together. But so many times, here's what happens in our culture today. We rush through the words. Because everyone today wants to rush through the ceremony to get to the party. Because our culture emphasizes the party. Because, you know, think about the movies, right? Whenever there's a ceremony, and oh, I, I'm, I would only notice this because, you know, I'm sensitive, whatever. But the, the pastors, you notice the minister... It's always some thin, little, meek, little, bald-headed guy, isn't it? And, you know, they're doing the ceremony, and it always gets interrupted in goofy ways, like the ex, you know, spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend comes crashing in, and, ah, oh, it's a mess. And then they get to the party. The wedding has become all about the party. People reserve the ballroom before they reserve the church. But when you look back, and you think about your marriage today, What's going to carry you through the hard times? And I'm not saying you can't have a party. Celebrate each other's lives. Celebrate family. Celebrate what God has done. But let me just say this to those of you who aren't married yet. Don't be so nervous for the ceremony that you've just run through it to get to the party. Realize this is the one of the most important worship services of your life. It's a time when you both are saying yes to Jesus and yes to each other in incredible ways. This is very often, if I can do it, here or even in an outdoor wedding, before I walk out with that groom, I say a prayer with the groom. And I just ask Jesus to be all over him. And one of the most profound things that can happen to me during a wedding is when a couple comes together and I sense the Holy Spirit on them. It's a holy moment. They say yes to Jesus and yes to each other. When you recall that, that's what's going to matter in your marriage. Now looking back, you might be thinking, well, you know, ah, I didn't really do that. I, I didn't really understand that. I just... I just, I just kind of wanted to rush through this thing. But listen, even if you didn't understand it all, I bet if you were to go back and whether you had it videotaped or look at the pictures or the order of ceremony, I bet you said some holy words. 
I bet you said some sacred things. I bet you can go back and say, yep, it really mattered what I said. Because I wanted God part of my day. I wanted God part of our lives. And let me tell you, that part's not fantasy. That's not fairy tale. It was sacred. It was a place of worship. So you see what mattered on your wedding day? You're beginning to catch some glimpses about what matters in your marriage. And this is just the starting point. I, I hope we can hear more. And, and, and right now, there might be some of you that are thinking, oh boy, I messed up. I failed. I want you to understand that there's grace in all of this. If we simply admit we may or where we made our mistakes and we decide to dive into all that God has for us on this. He can bring conviction and then he brings forgiveness and then he brings freedom. Just let's stop looking for fulfillment in the wrong places. Let's stop buying into the fairy tale because there's so much more fulfillment that we can receive when we do it God's way. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you really do show us how we're most fulfilled. And God, we just, you know where we live. You know how we live. You know what we get bombarded with. I pray that we would be able to discern what's false and what's true, what's fantasy, what's a fairy tale. That God, that we can truly be to each other in our marriages or in our future marriages. And as we support married couples, we can really see what's most important. Pure glory, Jesus. Amen.